Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 481st episode, we've got a brand new stegosaur to talk about from the early Cretaceous. Yes, we do. We've also got tyrannosaur gut contents. We have a few stories about dinosaurs and their food. Yeah, but tyrannosaur gut contents are extremely rare. And everyone always wants to know what tyrannosaurs are eating. That's true. We've also got a news item about a cannibal Albertosaurus. That's pretty intense. Mm -hmm. Another tyrannosaur. And I've got a fun fact, which put me down an interesting Erichtodromius burrow about the amount of meat on various animals. (laughs) Is this really related to the tyrannosaur gut contents? It was, yeah. And it led me to like the Utah 4-H club and all sorts of different interesting places online. I'll explain more later. And then we've got dinosaur of the day, Urbacodon, a troodontid. A lot of carnivores going on in this episode. We had a lot of herbivores recently, so. That's true. Got to balance it out. Speaking of carnivores, before we get into all of this, I don't know if you've heard or not. You probably have at this point, but we're celebrating 200 years of Megalosaurus. And I mean, we as in collective dinosaur world. <laughs> Megalosaurus was named 200 years ago, in yes. other words. Yes, February 20th. 1824. Yes. And we, I Know Dino, are celebrating with a free event where we will be having some trivia. You should bring some art supplies because we'll be doing some drawings and talking all about Megalosaurus and specifically how our understanding of it has changed in the last 200 years. So to sign up, there are limited spots available. You can go to inodino.com slash 200 years. We have room for 100 people. And last I checked, we had 30 people registered. So better get on that. Is it 200, like 200 years? Yes. So I know dino.com slash 200 years. Nice. We can all celebrate Megalosaurus together. Yeah. And dinosaurs in general. Speaking of celebrating, we're going to celebrate some new patrons who joined. All right. We have 10 new patrons to thank yet again. Yes. Our first new patron to thank is Joao who's actually been a patron for a while, but recently upgraded. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Then our other patrons are Mega Venator. They specifically requested the British pronunciation. Mm, Instead of Mega Venator. Yes. (laughs) Also, Maria, Chuck, Jasmine, Fia, Cassidy, Juliana, Ali exists, and Kevin M., all recently joined too. That's so cool. Thank you for joining and being a dino at all with us. Yes, thank you very much. Oh, actually, Fia and Juliana both upgraded as well. So thank you, since I shouted out Joao for doing that. Yes, thank you. Which reminds me, we will be sending out those patches very soon. Yes. I just got a 500 pack of envelopes at Costco and 750 labels <laughs> <laughs> so we gotta put these things together do a couple hundred envelopes with the patches then they'll be getting to your mailboxes shortly yes along with a special gift to go along with it mm-hmm. jumping into the news i get to start because it's about a newly named dinosaur yeah the new dinosaurs always get to go first, mm-hmm. even when there's Tyrannosaur gut contents to talk about. Yeah, but new dinosaur. Which are arguably more exciting. Stegosaur? Come on. <laughs> That's true. There aren't that many stegosaurs. Good point. Yeah. And this one's from the early Cretaceous. And there's not as many stegosaurs from the early Cretaceous. Are they mostly Jurassic, I guess? I think so. Yeah. I mean, that's what Stegosaurus is Jurassic, so I assume. So this one's name is Yan Beilong Ultimus, and it was published about in Historical Biology by Lei Jia and others. I think I could guess what continent this one's from. Asia. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, good guess. There's a few giveaways there. <laughs> <laughs> the clearly Mandarin name with long on the end, the author name, a lot of clues. So you could narrow it down even more, and it was found in what's now China. Yeah. 
But first, I really like this quote in the paper. They said, quote, Stegosaurs are a minor but iconic clade of Ornithischian dinosaurs, end quote. Absolutely. Yes. Wanted to shout that out for all the Stegosaur fans out there. And along with their close relatives, the Ankylosaurs. Oh. They are the best. I was wondering why you were jumping onto that so quickly. Well, I was just reminded I was talking to a patron about my favorite hat when I was a kid, which was a Stegosaurus, a bright red Stegosaurus hat Mm -hmm. with blue plates that stuck up over the top. It was like a winter hat that covered my ears and kept them nice and toasty. (laughs) And I wore this hat until I was probably in like fifth grade, maybe sixth grade, way past when all the other kids were not wearing dinosaur stuff anymore. But I loved that hat. And I never really realized that until recently Mm -hmm. that Stegosaurus and Ankylosaurus, which shortly after that became my favorite dinosaur, that those were so closely related. That's true. Because they're all Thyreophorans or Thyreophorans, depending on where you want to put the emphasis. I would argue that Stegosaurs are a bit more iconic than Ankylosaurs. Probably. The plates are like just a whole thing. Yeah. And I think stegosaurs have appeared in more media than ankylosaurs. Yeah, probably. Because I'm thinking like Fantasia, Land Before Time. Yeah. A lot of those early dinosaur, like there was a stegosaurus on the moon in that one silent movie. <laughs> I forgot about that one. <laughs> they, they were showing up everywhere. They're so interesting looking. There's nothing alive today that has plates like that on its back. So definitely capture the imagination. Yes. So stegosaurs, as we were saying, a lot of them were from the Jurassic, the middle Jurassic, but they stretched out to the early Cretaceous. They've been found on most continents, except for Australia and Antarctica. And apparently there's only 17 valid stegosaur taxa right now. I was surprised to read that. It sounds about right. Yeah. I guess we mostly talk about stegosaurus when we're talking about stegosaurs. Yeah. And stegosaurus is kind of unusual in that it has huge plates. A lot of them had much smaller display structures. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's, like I was saying, not even as many stegosaur taxa from the early Cretaceous. There's only four known before now. So it was Paranthodon, Wuerhosaurus homhenai, Wuerhosaurus ordosensis, and Mongolostegus expectabilis. So there were only three genera, and one of them has two species. Yes. But now we can add another dinosaur to that, which is Jan Balong the fifth stegosaur that lived in the Cretaceous, and one of the last stegosaurs known. It lived in the early Cretaceous in what is now Zoyun County in Shanxi province in China. It was found in the Zoyun Formation. And it's closely related. It's a sister taxon to the clade that includes Stegosaurus and Wuerosaurus. They know it's a new dinosaur because it had unique features in the upper back vertebrae and pelvis. The holotype's a partial skeleton that includes vertebrae from the neck and back, one tailbone, and parts of the pelvic area. And the holotype was an adult. Did they have any plates? No plates. Oh. Yeah. But the paleoart, it looks a lot like other stegosaurs with the bulky body, the plates on the back, thagomizers, and the elongated head. I would say it's a lot of speculation at this point, though. It's not too surprising because a lot of times stegosaurs are pretty fragmentary. We don't have very many complete skeletons. Yes. Yeah, not only are they rare in the number of species, but the fossils of each species is kind of rare. Mm-hmm. The genus name Yanbei refers to the north of Yanmen Pass in Chinese, where the holotype was discovered. And the Yanmen Pass is is, quote, an historically important pass on the Great Wall. And then long means dragon. And then the species name Ultimus means last in Latin, quote, indicating that this stegosaur might be the last of its lineage, end quote. Hmm. Dinosaurs in this area were first found back in 1958, and a lot of different types have been found there. They include dromaeosaurs, ceratopsians, hadrosaurs, sauropods, allosaurs, and ankylosaurs. Oh, ankylosaurs and stegosaurs coexisting. Yeah. That's not something that happens all that often. Ankylosaurs were mostly later. Stegosaurs were mostly earlier. Yep. But when you've got a late stegosaur and an early ankylosaur. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. They can meet in the middle. Mm-hmm. Sometimes. 
Now that we're done with that stegosaur, we can talk about those tyrannosaur gut contents. Move on, herbivore. Now it's all about the carnivores. <laughs> I was just talking about how much I like stegosaurs. But... <laughs> <laughs> A way to switch gears very quickly. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I think since this was the paper that I read, I got very excited about it. I, I'm excited too. It's gut contents. Everyone loves gut contents. At least everyone on this show. Yes. All two of us. <laughs> <laughs> So this new paper was written by Francois Therrien and others and published in Science Advances, and it is a new juvenile tyrannosaur with gut contents. All right. It's the first published example of an articulated juvenile tyrannosaur with preserved gut contents, and those gut contents are preserved exactly where you'd expect a stomach to have been when it was alive. That means it died right after eating a meal. Not right after. But yeah, within about a week, mm. the gut contents, the presumed gut contents, maybe I should say, were found inside the rib cage, which is always a very good place to find it. And in this case, there was not only the ribs on the side, but there were gastralia underneath too. So it's pretty well enclosed in the body cavity, as they sometimes call it. Mm -hmm. It's pretty unlikely that they got washed in. There were also differences in the sediment a little bit. So it looks like it fossilized from inside the animal and didn't just happen to be that a tyrannosaur fossilized on top of something smaller and then it got misinterpreted as gut contents. We mm. think it actually is gut contents. Basically as definitive as gut contents get. That's cool. So this is a juvenile Gorgosaurus. It was found in Canada and it's at the Royal Tyrol Museum. It's kind of an afterthought, actually, the the notes about the Gorgosaurus, <laughs> even though it's a new juvenile tyrannosaur, which is a pretty cool find. Mm -hmm. The fact that it has gut contents just completely overshadowed <laughs> the discovery of the tyrannosaur itself. From the histology of the slice through a bone, they think it was about five to seven years old. There are five to seven lags in the bone. I guess technically it could be slightly older if it's missing some lags. It was about four meters long and weighed about 335 kilograms or about 740 pounds. So just a reminder of how big tyrannosaurs could get. Yes. So it was 335 kilograms at about five to seven years old. If it had reached adulthood, it probably would have reached about 3,000 kilograms, so almost 10 times as much, and it would have been about nine meters long. So <laughs> this juvenile was a little less than half the length of an adult and only about an eighth of the weight. Really, the juvenile Gorgosaurus was a lot closer in size to a Utah raptor than it was to an adult Gorgosaurus. Yeah, I want to run into either of those. No, actually, it might be worse to run into the Utah raptor or juvenile Gorgosaurus. Although maybe not, because we'll get into what it exactly ate in a second. <laughs> of the Gorgosaurus, before I get into the gut contents, they found the base of the tail forward of the animal, basically. So a lot of it, other than just the back part of the tail. They're essentially just missing one of the legs and the neck. That means that they have the skull, most of an arm, which is pretty cool mm. and uncommon. They have an, a complete leg. They have the gastralia. And a lot of details, obviously, around its body cavity, so the ribs and everything. Mm -hmm. It's all articulated. And it clearly was preserved in one of those characteristic theropod death poses where the neck is bent like really dramatically back. So it's like it's trying to touch its forehead to its pelvis kind of thing, like arching its neck way, way back. Mm -hmm. And that's where the vertebrae are missing from the neck. So the head is still there, oh. like right above the hips, basically. But the, the neck, neck in between missing. is missing just with the way that it happened to fossilize. And there was some erosion. They didn't, obviously, they discovered this fossil eroding out of the rock and some of it is a little bit eroded. So that could be partly why the vertebrae are missing too. For many years, scientists have assumed that juveniles filled a different niche than adults by eating different prey. This is true in all sorts of animals that make a really dramatic size change throughout their lifetime. They had a bunch of examples like amphibians and fish and all sorts of animals that go through different metamorphoses too, like caterpillars to butterflies and things like that, all change their diet really drastically. But it is less common in reptiles and in mammals. So it seems a little surprising to us, <laughs> mm -hmm. but throughout the animal kingdom, there are plenty of examples of animals where the juveniles are sort of a, a totally different ecological niche than the adults. 
Presumably, young tyrannosaurs were faster and able to catch smaller, more nimble prey, but they also weren't yet strong enough to take on large prey. And that would mean that they were probably focusing on smaller prey instead of large prey. There's a caveat here, though, and that's that there are wear marks on the teeth of some young tyrannosaurs that seem to show they occasionally ate larger prey. Hmm. That could possibly be from them scavenging, or it could be that parents gave them pieces of larger prey to eat because we think, like with many predators, maybe there was some parental care here. Mm -hmm. Maybe like a wolf pack, the baby tyrannosaurus followed around the adults and got some lessons in hunting as well as some food from the adults. Mm -hmm. The young tyrannosaurus also had thinner blade-like teeth compared to the bulky teeth of the adults. But until now, we didn't have much evidence about what the juveniles ate. We just knew that it was probably different. Yeah, other than those wear marks on the teeth. So there's a little bit of a debate that maybe it was similar. Mm. And I'm going to leave a little cliffhanger there where we pause for a quick sponsor break. But when we get back, I will tell you what's in the gut contents. So on to the gut contents. About time. <laughs> of the Gorgosaurus juvenile. So the gut contents are another dinosaur, actually two dinosaurs. They're both identified as the Ovaraptorosaur Sidipes, and they were, quote, consumed in two separate feeding events, end quote. They know this. Yes. So it didn't just gobble up two in like a epic chase. Mm -hmm. It ate one and then a little while later caught another one. I'll explain how they know that in a second. They think that maybe the reason there were multiple Ovaraptorosaurs available to be eaten in a short time period is because Ovaraptorosaurs laid a lot of eggs. Mm. Their clutches often had over 30 eggs in them. So that means there were a lot of baby Ovaraptorosaurs running around. So Ovaraptorosaurs, not only were they not egg thieves, but they were the ones providing <laughs> food with their multiple eggs. Yes. So <laughs> they were like overrapted. <laughs> like, <laughs> they were eaten by, you know, like thieved mm -hmm. eggs rather than. They were the victims of the eggs. theft. Yeah, that's true. Good point. Last week, we also mentioned City Pez because it's a close relative to the new overrapter, so Eoneophron. And there aren't many tooth marks on the City Pez bones in the gut contents, which means that the parts that were swallowed may have been swallowed whole rather than been chewed on in any way. Whoa. And you may think, okay, some estimates put an adult city pez at about two meters long and 32 kilograms or 71 pounds. So swallowing an animal that size would be like swallowing a 10-year-old human. Hmm. That's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. These authors, for the record, think that the maximum city pez size was more like 20 kilograms, or I guess that'd be 44 pounds. Still. Still pretty big. But smaller. Yes. And of course, these city pez had recently hatched. They did histology and they didn't find any lags. So they think they were probably under one year old. Hmm. And they were significantly smaller than those estimated adult sizes. Maybe their bones were easier to digest too, <laughs> being so young. So soft. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think they were something like their whole body was something like 10 kilograms hmm. or, you know, roughly 20 pounds, 22 pounds. The Gorgosaurus also didn't eat the whole animal. It only ate the legs as well as the tip of one of their tails. I'd be very interested to know how it ended up biting off the tip of one of its tails. Yeah. It kind of makes me think it might have been hunting it, like snapped off the end of the tail. Maybe. And or then gotten the rest of it. Or if it was scavenging and another Gorgosaurus or another predator came about and it happened to get the tip of the tail. It probably wasn't scavenging because since it ate the legs mm. and the legs are considered likely the meatiest part of the animal. Oh, so then it would have gotten dibs on the legs. Yes. And it got both legs of both individuals. It's missing, at least in the fossil record, the lower part of one of the legs. So really, we have about three and a half legs in total preserved in these gut contents. And it did include all of the toe claws, mm. which is how we know that it 
basically ate all four legs because there's four sets of toe claws. Eating toe claws sounds unpleasant. It does, doesn't it? And some other animals, some other dinosaurs and birds regurgitate stuff like toe claws because why would you want a whole bunch of toe claws in your stomach? Mm -hmm. But apparently Gorgosaurus, <laughs> their strategy was just to digest it, hmm. just leave it in the stomach for a while. Most of it will dissolve and then I guess they, you know, poop out whatever they don't digest. Yeah. Cityped probably had a short tail and a skinny neck, so most of the meat was likely in the upper leg, and that was likely why it basically gobbled up the legs and then moved on. Mm -hmm. According to Cape Karoo Meat, a South African company that sells ostrich meat, most ostrich meat comes from the legs. Oh, I didn't realize. Yeah. I mean, in a lot of livestock, there's a lot of meat in the legs and also sort of the top of the leg or the rump mm. area has a really sizable amount of the meat, mm -hmm. especially if you're talking about a bipedal animal. One really cool detail is we didn't have much of city pez before, and these legs are arguably the best fossils we've ever gotten for city pez. Some nice ham hocks. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's the, I think we had the leg and maybe the top of the foot, you know, the really long bones that are technically the foot that make it look like its knee is bending backwards, but really that's the ankle that's way up there. But we didn't have any of like the toe bones or the claws or anything. And now we've got uh, just a whole bunch of them to learn from, which is really cool. And they used the foot bones and leg bones in order to identify it as city pez, since we have those from other specimens. The bones of Cityped are in great shape considering they were found in a stomach. They're not really broken and they were articulated like it was just folded up in the stomach. <laughs> like it <laughs> What? It's literally like it just had a I don't know like a turkey leg and just swallowed the thing whole and then it just sat in the stomach. Wow. Yeah. There is a little bit of acid etching on the bones from the stomach acid that it was soaking in, mm -hmm. which is another really good sign that it's gut contents and not just a Cityped that happened to be fossilized nearby. Mm -hmm. One set of the legs is more etched than the other, oh. and that's where the assumption that they were eaten at different times comes from. I see. They compared the etching amount on these Cityped to uh, modern crocodile gut contents and found that the Gorgosaurus probably swallowed the legs less than a week before it died. Hmm. But obviously, it, it wasn't right before because one of them had some pretty good digestion going on. But the most important thing really is what it shows about overall tyrannosaur behavior because it shows that younger tyrannosaurs likely specialized on different prey than adults. Because if instead of finding these Cityped legs in it, we found some pieces of some ceratopsian or, you know, yeah, something to that effect. Something that, bigger. Yeah, then we'd think, okay, either it could hunt this in a group or something, or it was getting a little bonus from an adult that it was living around. But at least in this one specific individual's case, it seems to have been hunting on its own and probably wasn't reliant on its parents. It's hard to say overall if that was always the case, but at least sometimes they seem to fill a different niche. We also don't know for sure if an adult Gorgosaurus would or would not go after this sort of turkey-sized meal if they crossed paths with it. So we can't say definitively that this juvenile Gorgosaurus ate Cityped, whereas the adult wouldn't because we just don't know for sure. Probably depends on how easy it would have been to get that meal. Yes, very much so. It is, I would say, probable, though, that Cityped might have been too small and agile to be worth the chase from a larger predator. And we also do have evidence of larger Tyrannosaurs eating larger prey, for example, like T. rex chomping on Triceratops. So we know that a lot of them did specialize on these bigger herbivores. There's also a paper from Dave Verricchio in 2015 about gut contents from another Tyrannosaur, Despletosaurus. And he found that Despletosaurus had vertebrae and a jaw from juvenile hadrosaurs in its stomach. So that larger Despletosaurus was hunting larger prey, not as big, obviously, as an adult hadrosaur, but still bigger than a city pez, especially a baby city pez. So many gut contents. Yeah, it's great. Well, as promised, Albertosaurus may have been a cannibal. Do we know this from gut contents? 
Is there a baby Allosaurus found in the guts of an adult Allosaurus? Nothing that dramatic, no. <laughs> Nothing that definitive? No, it's more about teeth and tooth marks. Okay, the usual. So this was published in Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences by Colton Kopak and Phil Curry. And we've talked about Albertosaurus before as the dinosaur of the day in episode 86. The type species is Albertosaurus sarcophagus. I love sarcophagus as the species name. <laughs> it's, it's a good so one. Good. <laughs> it was also named in the same paper as Tyrannosaurus rex by Henry Osborne back in 1905. Nice. That was a big paper. Mm -hmm. The fossils were first found in 1884 by Joseph Burr Tyrrell. Yes, that Tyrrell from the Royal Tyrrell Museum. And Albertosaurus was pretty big. They could get up to 26 to 30 feet or 8 to 9 meters long. Being a tyrannosaur, they walked on two legs. They had a large head and a long muscular tail. They also had small arms with only two fingers on each hand. And Albertosaurus has been found in bone beds. There's one with 26 individuals, and that's a mix of adults, subadults, and juveniles. Whoa. Yeah. I feel like we need to do an episode just on that. That's crazy. Or maybe an episode on bone beds. Mm-hmm. When I hear Albertosaurus, I always think Albertosaurus, Gorgosaurus, and Despletosaurus all in like the same sort of family of these 30-foot, 9-meter-ish tyrannosaurs that were around before T-Rex. Mm -hmm. Although Albertosaurus was a little bit later than the other two. Mm -hmm. Well, Albertosaurus bones have been found all over the Horseshoe Canyon formation in Alberta, Canada. And more recently, they've been found in the Danek bone bed, which is also known for having lots of Edmontosaurus fossils. These Albertosaurus sarcophagus specimens were first described in 2014 from the Danek bone bed, and since then, more Tyrannosaurid fossils have been found. The thinking is that these fossils belong to Albertosaurus sarcophagus because it's the only Tyrannosaurid and Albertosaurine known from there. So a lot of fossils have been found here, including nearly 200 tyrannosaurid shed teeth, <laughs> as well as some cranial and postcranial, so skull and body bones. There's a lot of teeth. Yes. Also included in that are left and right tyrannosaurid pubes. Hip bones. Yes. The left one has multiple tooth marks, which was most likely made after that dinosaur died because the marks are really deep in the animal's body and there's no sign of healing. Yeah. If you're getting to the hip, like the center of the hips, mm -hmm. there's a lot of meat on top of that point. Like I was talking about with city pets, like the legs have a lot of the meat. And that would be maybe the meatiest part right up by the hip. But that would not be an easy one to get to. No, but you could see how there'd be enough meat that you'd want to be just scraping it off mm -hmm. every last little morsel off the bone there. And these tooth marks, they're large and they're gouge like and there's a lot of them. So that and the fact that there's so many teeth in this bone bed makes it seem like there was some cannibalism. Hmm. Because those hips are also from Albertosaurus. Those hips don't lie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, not quite as exciting as finding gut contents, but still pretty cool. You can learn so much from trace marks. Mm-hmm. We do have one more story that has to do with what dinosaurs ate. This one is about troodontids. Covering from very large to quite small carnivores. Well, in this case, the troodontids may have been more herbivorous than we thought. Oh, weird. Yeah. So this was published in GSA Bulletin by Thomas Cohen and Brian Cousins, and they studied the teeth from dinosaurs in the Oldman Formation in Alberta, Canada. And they looked at isotopes and element ratios like strontium and calcium, as well as barium and calcium, on tooth enamel. And from that, you can determine what types of food that the dinosaurs ate. So they looked at the teeth of hadrosaurids, ceratopsids, ankylosaurs, and troodontids. Hadrosaurs, of course, they're the duckbills. The ceratopsids are the ones that are large, four-legged animals, usually with horns and frills. Like triceratops? Yes. Uh, ankylosaurs, of course, have the tail clubs, and the troodontids are very bird-like. Yeah, they're pretty similar to dromaeosaurids or raptors, the sort of like small bird-like ones with the sickle claws sometimes and mm -hmm. all that going on. So focusing on what they ate, they found that 
hadrosaurs ate plants that grew at higher levels compared to ceratopsids and ankylosaurs. And that's not too surprising because ceratopsids and ankylosaurs tend to have their heads low to the ground. Yes. And they're just shorter than hadrosaurs in most cases, too. Mm-hmm. Troodontids, though, have been thought to be carnivores, omnivores, or herbivores. And in this study, they found that the troodontids were likely mixed feeding to plant dominant omnivores. Hmm. So they're more on the plant side than the carnivore side based on what's going on with their teeth. Interesting. Yeah. And the shape of their teeth is also very strange because they're serrated in a way that people have described them as being like almost fragile serrations where. Mm-hmm. Maybe that was better for plants because like Troodon itself is just named from the teeth because they're pretty unique. Yes. Maybe one day there'll be some really good gut contents of a Troodontid. That'd be helpful. It would be. Although as we know, coprolites of herbivores do not preserve as well as coprolites of carnivores, partly because there's more calcium Mm -hmm. in the carnivore coprolites, which helps preserve them. And partly because plant matter just decays pretty quickly in general. Could you get some kind of fossil in time of a troodontid biting into a plant <laughs> uh, and somehow they got fossilized? It's caught in amber with yeah. like a, to- a troodontid tooth with little like leaf pieces stuck to it. Actually, now that I'm saying it, there are some plants that have those little like silicate crystals or whatever, like how grasses and some other plants have like tough parts Mm. that sometimes don't decay for a really long time. Maybe we could find that preserved with the teeth. Yeah, that's not so much to ask, right? (laughs) Could happen. Or the wear pattern that matches those parts on the plant. It's a solvable question. Yeah, you get closer and closer with each study. Mm -hmm. And we will get on to our dinosaur of the day in just a moment. But first, a break for our sponsors. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Arbacodon, which was a request from Tyrant King via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. We're keeping with the troodontids here because Arbacodon was a troodontid that lived in the late Cretaceous and what is now Uzbekistan. The paleo art depicts it as very bird-like with a long tail, long legs with sharp claws and having a beak. Now, troodontids, of course, have lots of bird-like features. They're small to medium in size, and they're known from North America and Asia. They were agile, they had good vision and hearing, and a relatively large brain, and they had long legs, and were probably fast runners. Like you were just saying, some of them might have been basically herbivores. Yeah. Which is kind of weird for that set of features, but sometimes dinosaurs are weird. (laughs) Yeah, they're a xenosaurus. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Now, troodontids are pretty rare. Yeah, they're definitely not the most common ones in the fossil record. Yeah. The type species of Urbacodon is Urbacodon idemirensis. It was named in 2007 by Alexander Averyanov and Hans Seuss. The genus name Urbacodon means Urbac tooth. And Urbac, U R B A C, it's an acronym in honor of the Uzbek, Russian, British, American, and Canadian scientists who worked on this discovery. Oh, that's cool. Mm-hmm. I like that. I love when these scientific groups bridge, you know, these divides with countries that might not be getting along super well all the time. It just seems so nice. Yeah, it's always nice to have multicultural studies going on. The species name Idamirensis refers to Idamir, which is the type locality. And the first dinosaur bones found in the formation where Urbacodon was found, in the Darjara Kaduk formation, they were found back in 1914 by A.D. Ark Hengelski. A lot of geologists visited this area in the 1930s, and the best find at that time was a complete turtle shell. Was it the best find? Of the 1930s. I guess. (laughs) I feel like they might have found a dinosaur. (laughs) Well. That we would consider better. (laughs) Then in 2004, enter Urbacodon. The holotype is a single left lower jaw or dentary with teeth. And this jaw was found on September 9th of 2004. The dentary is about 3.1 inches or 79 millimeters long. And it's got 32 teeth. That's a lot of teeth for such a small jaw. Yeah. Or I should say placements for 32 teeth. Oh, yeah. 
because they're not always all preserved. Yeah. Uh, the dentary looks straight. There's a gap between the front 24 teeth and the back 8 teeth, but that could be due to individual variation. The teeth, however, were not serrated. So hmm. this, yeah, this is one of the few troodontids with unserrated teeth. I didn't know there were any troodontids with unserrated teeth. Well, let me tell you, <laughs> there are a few others, including Archaeornithoides, Byronosaurus, and May. Hmm. Is that May long? It is. Now, Urbacodon looks similar to Byronosaurus in May, but there's differences in the grooves and tooth crowns. Also, Urbacodon is much bigger than May. Hmm. Urbacodon, though, is closely related to Byronosaurus and Shishiosaurus. And this discovery helped show that there was more troodontid diversity in Asia than we previously thought. There have been teeth and other fossils described by Lev Nesov were found in the nearby Bisecti Formation, and those were referred to Urbacodon species, so some sort of species of Urbacodon. Hard to know from just teeth. Yes. Well, there were a few other fossils. So in 2016, Averyanov and Suze described in more details the fossils that they assigned to Urbacodon species. And they include teeth, parts of the jaw, a partial brain case, vertebrae, and parts of the feet. There's enough similarities to know it belongs to Urbacodon, but they just don't know enough yet to assign it to the same species. Because it's hard when the holotype's just the lower jaw. Yeah. And they didn't find a lower jaw. Oh, maybe. They said parts of the jaw. Parts of the jaw. But yeah, enough to know Urbacodon. Urbacodon species, these fossils they look similar to byronosaurus gobi venator and shishiosaurus and there's no teeth serrations they did a phylogenetic analysis and they didn't find a clade of troodontids from asia with unserrated teeth however so that's not the thing that they have in common hmm. and other animals that lived around the same time and place included salamanders turtles crocodiliforms and pterosaurs and our fun fact of the day is that a 10 kilogram or 22 pound juvenile city pez would have had less than four kilograms or eight pounds of meat? That's based on ostrich proportions. I see your connection now, and I was wondering why you brought up ostrich meat earlier. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that means that if a juvenile Gorgosaurus weighed about 350 kilograms, then a single city pez is about 1% of its weight. Or for human scale, that's equivalent to a typical person eating about a 700 gram or one and a half pound meal. That's a large meal. Well, if you think about like the whole meal, you know, I guess if you're eating a steak, that's like a 20, 22 ounce steak. Mm. But if you're having like a steak with some, you know, a side of mashed potatoes and whatever, you can get to a pound and a half for a meal pretty easily. I see. But if we're going for the equivalent here... Because that Gorgosaurus ate toe claws and just meat. Yeah. So you might want to stick to just meat to compare. I see what you're saying. Yeah. But there's also like skin and fat and other stuff. True. And it's a lot of water weight. But yeah, you're right. It is mostly meat. We're not hyper carnivores though. So we don't <laughs> tend to eat just meat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the way that uh, Gorgosaurus probably did. For an adult Gorgosaurus, it would only be about 0.1% of its weight, which would be equivalent to a typical person eating about 70 grams or 2.4 ounces of food. Okay. Which probably wouldn't be worth running around for if you had to run around and catch something that size. Mm -hmm. That would be kind of like us running around trying to catch a mouse. <laughs> it just doesn't seem worth the effort. According to the American Ostrich Association... A 12-month-old ostrich weighs about 250 pounds and produces about 90 pounds of meat. Hmm. Also, according to them, most of the meat is in their legs. That's where I got that factoid from. As a result of that meat-to-body size ratio, it's about 36% meat on an ostrich, which seems like a lot. Yeah. But it actually isn't that much. I'll get into some other examples. There's a term for how much butchered meat you get from an animal. It's called the dressing percentage, hmm. something I did not know about until I was doing this fun fact. So dressing percentage is a little weird, though, because it also includes a lot of bones. If you imagine, you know, racks of butchered cow or 
pork or whatever. It's got all those like ribs and other bones mixed in with it. It's just what you're left with when you take off all the stuff people don't want to eat, which might not be the perfect analogy for dinosaurs because a lot of them probably wanted to eat the organs and the organs aren't included in the dressing percentage. Mm -hmm. But it depends because they probably didn't eat all the organs. All the dinosaurs didn't eat all the organs, maybe I should say. The dressing percentage for an ostrich is 51%. Pretty good. Or is that not good? It is pretty good. It's not great, likely because they haven't been fully domesticated and bred to have huge amounts of meat on their bodies. Mm -hmm. Apparently, ostriches are considered like partially domesticated animals. We've only been sort of domesticating them for about 150 years. Hmm. By comparison, most adult cattle raised for beef have a dressing percentage of about 63%. That's according to Penn State. Younger cattle are lower at about 61%, and dairy breeds are even lower at about 56% or sometimes less than that. Although cows have heavier bones than birds, so their meat percentage actually isn't too far off from that of an ostrich. The dressing percentage of a domestic hog, a.k.a. a pig, averages 72%, which is a little bit higher. Yeah. That's according to Texas A&M. All these good agricultural schools and institutions to get these facts from. The main reason it's higher for hogs or pigs is because the dressing percentage includes the skin because it's left on since there's a lot of extra fat under the skin. Mm. So that boosts their numbers a little bit. But the really impressive ones that I found are the domesticated birds. Okay, I was just about to ask about chickens. <laughs> yeah, they're really mostly meat. So commercial broiler chickens, which are the ones that you get when you buy a chicken most of the time, have a dressing percentage of about 75%, which means only 25% of the animal isn't what you get when you buy a chicken. Mm-hmm. And a study of 4-H turkeys in Utah found an average dressing percentage of 79% for turkeys, and some of them were above 80%, which is just like so much meat. It's way higher than the ostriches. Plus, you know, getting a chicken or a turkey to that size is a period of months, Mm -hmm. not years. I'm always amazed at how light a turkey or a chicken skeleton is once all the meat is removed, too. It's always like there's nothing like it's just like all meat. Yeah. It's crazy. They're very efficient animals. It makes you wonder how a domesticated dinosaur would change compared to the real Mesozoic animals, too. Hmm. I'm imagining like a velociraptor with such big breast muscles that it could barely jump like domesticated turkeys. Oh, yeah. Or chickens. Yeah. Or like a hadrosaur with extremely thick legs and tail muscles, like how some horses are bred Hmm. or, you know, cows and pigs. Just be interesting to see the uh, (laughs) interpretation of what a domesticated dinosaur would look like. We don't really know what the non-domesticated one looks like either since we just have the bones, but. It's all highly speculative. Yeah. Interesting thought though. Mm Mm-hmm. Interesting thought experiment. Yeah. And I thought it was interesting, too, that for these bipedal dinosaurs, most of the meat would be in those legs. So if you see like that with that Gorgosaurus where it chomped off the legs, it almost certainly hunted it. It's not scavenging. Or if you see something else where it's chewing on back vertebrae or something, Mm -hmm. there's a decent chance that it got there later because you can learn a lot. We got some pretty in-depth information about modern birds aka dinosaurs and where their meat is yes and on that interesting note that wraps up this episode of i know dino thank you for listening stay tuned in our next episode we'll be celebrating the 200th anniversary of megalosaurus so don't worry if you can't make it to our free event and if you want more dinosaur goodness then head over to inodino.com we've got links in our show notes Thanks again, and until next time.